Good morning. Um, thank you for inviting me to talk in this uh, session. I'm, um, I'm going to talk about this project called Ella Rebellion, Creating a New Black Cinema, that happened at uh, Tate Modern in the cinema there in uh, last April. Um, but as a way to talk about that, I'm going to sort of try and talk about the kind of institutional context, what it means to present film within a museum that's dedicated largely to the visual arts, what it means to present work that is generally sits outside of established histories of cinema or the visual arts, uh, what it meant to kind of engage with different sort of community groups and audiences and bring those into the institution, how we sort of tried, different ways we tried to do that. Um, Tate, as you probably all know, is, you know, one of the biggest institutions, uh, you know, in the UK. Uh, <laughs> Tate Modern specifically is dedicated to international art from 1900 onwards. Uh, Tate Britain is dedicated to British work. So in some ways, like, Tate Modern's remit is and should be to deal with international practice. So it's foundation and it's kind of reason for being is to deal with diversity of practice, to deal with how practice uh, emerges internationally, how it's the connection between different cultures and their influence in the UK. Um, that, you know, is always that kind of ambition or desire to be an international museum is also then balanced against the way histories are constructed, balanced against how the museum believes it can sell, what it can shows it can sell tickets for, enough tickets to kind of keep the museum going. They have uh, about five million visitors a year and need to have five million visitors a year to cover their overheads. And especially going forward, as the government reduces the grant in aid, they need to increase those numbers. Um, so they kind of have this dual tension, which I think is something that we'll find across a lot of institutions, a desire to be more open, more diverse, um, but also to test that against kind of uh, established histories against kind of bankable histories, so familiar names uh, that they know they can sell certain amounts of tickets for. Um, and kind of within that as well then, film kind of has a weird position. Probably one of the biggest challenges that Tate <laughs> programming films there is just letting people know that there is actually a cinema at Tate. <laughs> it's a very simple thing, but often it's not the type of event that people imagine that's going to happen there. And also the type of cinema that should be within the museum is something we also try and uh, problematize as much as we can. It's very important for us that the cinema is a kind of critical space. It's, a, it's not an interpretive space. It's a space that kind of challenges uh, the rest of the museum, the institution in a certain way. It's a space that can be more flexible, can program in a quicker way. Uh, and in some ways, because of that, then we kind of have a remit or I see is the cinema has a remit and a necessity to program types of things that maybe don't happen elsewhere and also use the fact that it is such a prominent institution to do things that other venues might not. Um, so it's really the program is kind of seen as like a, or I approach it as kind of a catalyst. So it should be a place to kind of aggregate or kind of uh, provoke ways of thinking about how we can understand moving image throughout the 20th century, how we can understand its histories and how those histories need to be rewritten. Um, so when I joined Tate, I actually joined at this very exciting, kind of interesting moment a few years ago. Uh, Tate Modern, as you probably know, if anyone has been, it's a, in the middle of a uh, building site, going through a huge expansion. It's going to increase the exhibition spaces by 60%. Um, and with that, there's these kind of constant mantras that this new Tate, it's not an extension, it's a new Tate, uh, should also be more reflective of uh, international trends within modern art. And when I joined Tate, uh, these were the three exhibitions that were on at the same time. I think it's a kind of really landmark moment for the institution, a moment uh, and kind of provocation of what the institution could do, uh, which sometimes it follows in different ways, sometimes doesn't. So at the same time, uh, in September, what year is it, 2013, I guess, uh, there's these three shows. So Meshak Garba, uh, show the Museum of Contemporary African Art. There's a kind of m installation project looking at how African art could be institutionalized to create a museum within the museum to deal with the uh, areas of practice that have often been left out of uh, the museum's consideration. Um, uh, Ibrahim El Sahalahi, uh, a modernist painter who'd studied actually in Slade in London, but was largely kind of not uh, mapped within kind of histories of modern art. Uh, and also Shaker, a Lebanese artist, uh, 
key figure modernist sculptor in uh, uh, the Middle East, again, whose work had largely been overlooked, and most of, or a large majority of her work was in her apartment underneath her bed, gathering dust. Um, so this is a kind of great moment at Tate to kind of have these three shows looking at areas and histories that are not usually part of the institution. And for me, that was really like the model to try and follow, to pursue uh, within the film program. Um, just to give you an idea, this is the kind of contemporary uh, program so that's coming up. So we do three seasons a year, spanning December through September through December. Uh, and within that, try and have a kind of diversity of types of work. Um, so it could be a retrospective of the Catalan filmmaker Albert Serra. Uh, it could be a program of, uh, of uh, contemporary British work. This is a poster designed by the artist Peter Doig. It could be a retrospective of the Moroccan director Moumin Smihi. This is a season that was put together to parallel the exhibition of uh, Henri Matisse. Matisse, you know, who spent a long time and had formative influence through his time in Morocco. Uh, and uh, Moumin Smihi made work about his uh, time in Morocco and also a series of other works. So it's an opportunity to look at a key figure within European modernist cinema, but from uh, external position from a position outside of Europe and looking at the kind of that influence the other way around. Um, Chronicle of Interventions is a program looking at the legacy of artist practice in uh, Latin America. And then there's this project, uh, Magicians of Terre Reconsidered. This is a project uh, based on an exhibition at the Centre Pompidou in 1989. Uh, it's a key exhibition, a very polemical exhibition, inspired lots of uh, critical discussion about how museums could be international, how they could be global, how they could represent histories outside of Western Europe and North America. Um, it became a really controversial show, a show that's been criticised heavily for exoticization of other cultures, of creating hierarchies between them. Um, but still, it's a very pivotal show because it's one of the first shows that tried to deal with a whole range of international work on a kind of uh, clear system of division. So it had very clearly as 100 artists, 50 from Western Europe and North America, 50 from the rest of the world. Uh, and that type of uh, very basic kind of numbers or equation uh, is still something that no museum in the kind of Western world would be able to match that type of par parity. Uh, so even despite its problems, you know, it's a really interesting show to kind of provoke how you could develop a program that is equal that kind of has this, takes the issue of diversity in a very clear way to say we should have parity, and that parity is something that also should happen between male and female artists. Um, so for the anniversary of the show, we did a series of programs uh, recreating the original film program that accompanied that show. Uh, and this is a way to also think about how cinema's role with, happens within the museum. Um, and particularly how different histories of film practice kind of related to questions of ethnography, of travel, of uh, the treatment of artifacts or objects from other cultures. And central to that is this film called uh, Statues Also Die, filmed by Chris Marker and Alan Rene. Uh, that's, a show, that's a film documentary about uh, the Ethnographic Museum in Paris uh, and about the treatment of objects, what happens to objects when they're pulled out of one context and put into another. And this is a central kind of question uh, for museums, and particularly for museums as we approach uh, what we could talk about as international practice, how uh, criteria needs to be adjusted, what's the criteria that's applied to one set of art to, as opposed to another, uh, and how we can also change the way that we present that work, that it's not, we can't treat all the work in the same way, and actually the kind of parameters, the institution, the museum itself, uh, prescribes certain ways of reading a work, certain ways of understanding what that work is, understanding what an artist is. Uh, and that's something that's very central to a project like Meshach Scarba, Museum of African Art. Um, and this is also something that's become very prominent in contemporary practice. So this is a still from the film by Duncan Campbell, It For Others. This is a film uh, for which he won the Turner Prize uh, a few years ago, and is directly inspired and responding to uh, statues also die, and the legacy of commodities, how commodities are treated in the art world, how objects are treated, uh, and kind of stems out of a kind of critique of the British Museum and their treatment of objects and refusal to repatriate certain elements of their uh, collection, um, but also kind of uses that to kind of look at different ideas of commodity, how the art world deals with commodity and objects, 
and how we can understand those international exchanges. Um, so this idea of how one culture looks at another and another culture looks back was something that we tried to do within the program, something we tried to do throughout the program. So various within that we kind of paired different work. So this is two films. One is uh, Africa Sosen, which is one of the first films uh, made by an African filmmaker in Paris uh, and is a kind of reverse ethnographic film. So rather than a French filmmaker going to Africa to make a film, there's an African filmmaker coming to Paris. Uh, and we paired that with a film called uh, Cocorico Monsieur Poulet, which is a collaborative film uh, by African directors together with uh, uh, African directors Damoué Sike, Lam Dia and Jean Rouge. Uh, and this is a way to kind of look at these <coughs> parallel gazes. So that's just like a, sort of a kind of preamble uh, about how we try and understand and think about the cinema. And that kind of was the background to lead into the focus on this project, LA Rebellion. Uh, LA Rebellion is a term to describe a group of filmmakers who emerged from UCLA in the late 60s and 70s, uh, a group who came directly after the uprising, the kind of rebellion in Watts in the mid, uh, mid 60s, uh, came directly after the kind of uh, civil rights movement, after the anti-Vietnam war movement, uh, and kind of brought together these kind of questions of representation of uh, access to information, access to uh, to ways of making images to describe different areas and cultures within America. The kind of program came out of an ethnographic uh, course at UCLA that was set up in the uh, late 60s. There was an ethnographic program to deal that came out of the anthropological program there to deal with different cultures. And crucially, uh, they kind of made this realization that uh, there was a uh, similarly kind of ignored diversity, there was a kind of ag ignored communities within the US, in the heart of the US, and also on the doorstep of Hollywood, there's a whole communities that weren't depicted, uh, that weren't represented in film, um, and weren't given access to film to talk about their own stories. Uh, so there's a kind of class issue and a division there. Uh, and various of the movements kind of came together in the late 60s uh, to form a kind of protest at UCLA, kind of sitting to argue for more diverse uh, recruitment policy t into the university for filmmakers and students from Asian American background, Chicano, Latin American, uh, Native American, and also African American. Um, and this led to various works that kind of tried to deal with the kind of problems of ethnography, the problems of one culture looking at another, but tried to do that in a kind of active way rather than the kind of uh, traditional binary of one filmmaker from one culture going to another, actually to give people from these cultures the uh, access to equipment, to tools to film their own communities, to film themselves and to tell their own stories. Um, and this became a kind of central uh, element of the films that were emerged there. And these were films that were made by diverse kind of student body uh, within Hollywood who were given kind of access to equipment, to time, to resources, uh, and also to kind of collaborative ways of working. So it's very, uh, the kind of school program worked as a kind of mini film studio, kind of B-movie studio on the uh, doorsteps of Hollywood um, and brought in various different communities. So this is a community called, a uh, group that was set up called VC, Visual Communications. There's a, Af a group of Asian American uh, filmmakers and media activists. Um, and also essentially within that, this group of uh, African American uh, and African filmmakers who later became known as the Yellow Rebellion. This is a group of uh, filmmakers who took these opportunities to access to equipment uh, to produce uh, one of the most sustained kind of proposals for an independent cinema, a cinema made in a different way and outside of the uh, demands of uh, commercial filmmaking. So kind of counter to the emergent black exploitation cinema at the time, uh, paired with a kind of political awareness, a uh, kind of legacy of uh, discussions around ethnographic film, the potential of ethnographic film, uh, but also very politically aware of how uh, America, different communities could be presented and also America's role uh, internationally. So various of the filmmakers came from uh, directly from different countries overseas to study uh, there. So there were filmmakers from Latin America who studied there, made works together and collaborated. Uh, and made all these films, this kind of huge body of uh, work uh, that was largely, that had, was, uh, how do I say this? It was incredibly influential at the time, uh, but was incredibly influential in particular 
kind of communities, but it's an area of practice that has largely been left out of uh, the way film history has been written. There's lots of books, lots of seasons about the 70s, independent film in 70s America, the kind of Raging Bulls, Easy Rider sort of group that largely skips over any of the films made at UCLA. It's a very white kind of movie brat uh, culture. So this is an area of practice that, uh, despite making some of the most important independent films of the decade, kind of often uh, skipped, ignored, not written about. Um, but various projects are kind of sought to rewrite and explore these alternative practices uh, in Los Angeles in the 70s in particular, uh, work by this group of filmmakers who came to UCLA. So there's a huge project to restore these films um, as part of a project looking at post-war art in Los Angeles uh, called um, Pacific Standard Time that's funded by the Getty. And as part of that, UCLA did a big research project to go back to this generation of filmmakers, past students at UCLA, students whose work had kind of been ignored, whose legacy had not necessarily been followed within UCLA itself, to try and make amends for the changing in direction of the university to connect back to these uh, original kind of founding filmmakers and also to restore their works. They started the project thinking there was maybe six, eight, ten filmmakers. Ended up realizing there was actually more like 40. Uh, they did a huge project to, res to kind of recontact all these filmmakers, dig films out of people's garages uh, and start to restore them. So that was a huge project. And that was really, without that, anything like our project wouldn't have been possible and really the key thing with all of these films is that and with the project at Tate as well that these works are have been in circulation have been present the kind of a, there's an essay film made by Tom Anderson called Los Angeles Plays Itself that famously ends concludes with three of the key works from the early rebellion period um, that was seen as a major discovery rediscovery of these works but all of these works have not been lost there's plenty of lost films that are discarded. All these works have been sat in archives, but no one has been hiring them. Uh, the BFI has done great projects to help present over many years the work of uh, filmmakers uh, such as uh, Charles Burnett, whose work's in distribution. It's, his films are readily available at the BFI, can be hired for about £90, um, as well as people like Julie Dash. And so the project was really not a rediscovery of these things, but trying to look back at the importance of this broader group uh, to acknowledge these different generations of influence that had uh, kind of populated and uh, kind of led into the richness of this period and trying to reconnect to these uh, different histories uh, and their kind of broader influence both at the period, at the time, uh, within the US but also crucially internationally. There were some of the key films uh, presented in, in London at the venues like the Ritzy, the Third Eye Festival, various other events that were kind of key encounters between uh, filmmakers in the US and filmmakers in Britain. So groups like uh, Sankofa, uh, the Black Audio Collective, various filmmakers were directly in dialogue with many of the filmmakers who came out of the uh, LA Rebellion and went on to make other work. Uh, and crucially also, these works, and within the art museum, it was very important to reposition them in a way that was distinct to how they maybe were presented at UCLA, which told a kind of a, a story that was very much based on feature film as the key destination, as a key success. Uh, and our emphasis was to say, actually, we should value shorter works, we should value different types of work as much as we should a feature film. The success of these films cannot necessarily just be understood within cinema, it needs to be understood in a broader cultural framework, it needs to be understood in as much as how it influenced uh, artists who moved into the visual arts, uh, artists, uh, painters, musicians, uh, and so it shouldn't just be understood within cinema, despite how inf influential that was. So this is a still from uh, that just shows one of these kind of key connections. So the image is from Charles Burnett's Killer of Sheep uh, on one side, and the other image is a painting by uh, Kerry James Marshall, one of the most important African American painters. And this painting is directly inspired by this scene in Killer of Sheep. Uh, and there's many other artists who've kind of worked out of this legacy, sought to kind of re-explore that. Two minutes. Okay, so I'm going to uh, wrap up a bit. But you kind of get... <laughs> uh, similarly, music is really fundamental, performance. Uh, artists worked very closely to kind of performance artists, also working in different regions. Uh, Barbara McCullough made a amazing essay film in the late 70s that traced and kind of indexed 
uh, and interviewed many artists uh, and her contemporaries at that time active in Los Angeles. So David Hammonds and also Betty Saar, uh, artists who were friends, who were part of her circle, who are now uh, some of the most sought after uh, major contemporary American artists. Actually, the show at Tate followed directly to um, exhibitions at the White Cube Gallery, you know, London's premier kind of commercial gallery for David Hammonds and also uh, Nagunde Sendi, that was the kind of key London exhibitions of their work. So these artists have now, after many years, been acknowledged very much within the art world. And the Venice Biennial, if anyone has been or even read about it, central question is how, is looking at, one of its central kind of questions is the legacies and histories of African-American artists. Uh, that are now kind of actually being re-acknowledged, their position within these histories, in the histories of modernism, within the histories of abstract expressionism, uh, kind of being reconnected. So that was very important for us within the project to kind of make those bridges again, to kind of look at how these things tied together. Um, so to conclude, uh, we also needed to make, kind of pull out of these connections and kind of connect back to performance and contemporary work. And so to do that, the final event with an LA Rebellion, um, the event that tried to kind of bridge this kind of historical group, but also kind of re-embed it in a contemporary generation, uh, was a project with a uh, filmmaker, uh, activist, uh, and artist, uh, Ben Caldwell, who runs an organization called Chaos Network. Uh, it's a community organization in Lamert Park in the center of uh, South Central Los Angeles. Uh, it's an area that's going through massive uh, redevelopment at the moment. Redevelopment very similar and, and kind of parallel to redevelopments uh, and gentrification around uh, different parts of London, so Hackney or uh, Brixton. Um, and so we did an event where we brought in various uh, local uh, groups working with the organisa youth organisation at Take called the Take Collective, uh, who collaborated with Ben Caldwell. Uh, to discuss his work and to discuss possible people who could uh, accompany him in a kind of closing performance. A closing performance uh, that was presented in, along with his uh, collaborator, the um, actor Roger uh, Guinevere Smith, a project called Rodney King, uh, that looks at the history, the legacy of Rodney King, who was uh, beaten at the kind of height of the LA riots in the early 90s. Uh, a project that looks at these kind of cycles of violence, of uh, misrepresentation. The LA riots in the early 90s was one of the kind of key kind of media events, frenzies. The riots were inspired, kind of the thing that kind of was seen as the kind of uh, prompt catalyst for those kind of riots was the videotape that emerged of Rodney King being beaten. So this has various legacies with uh, histories of police brutality, of uh, neglect within different communities that are all too uh, apparent in contemporary time um, and kind of have, you know, very disturbing echoes in uh, how, you know, in these cycles of 20 years, these things are coming back again. So the project looked at the legacy of that uh, and also worked with the uh, kind of spoken word uh, group, the A&E, who kind of performed uh, as a kind of precursor to uh, the Rodney King performance that tried to kind of draw these circles, draw these links uh, between the US, between the UK, between media, between representation, between how images circulate, how they can be responded to, spoken back to, um, and how they can be re-engaged and reactivated for different communities and different generations. So, so make sense. Well <laughs>